Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the great pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Shipman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. We got a big weekend at one of our favorite racetracks, Brian, for the New Jersey Breds. Yeah. Hey, hey, if people have been following us for years, Matt, they know we love Monmouth Park. I haven't lived out east for a long time, but uh, Monmouth Park is special to both of us. So that's where we're going to start. Big day of racing, as you said, at Monmouth Park, led by, of course, the Haskell, Matt. Hey, quick question for you. Were you a little bit surprised when you saw the morning line and this guy, Arabian Knight, was made the favorite over the Kentucky Derby winner? Well, yes, and I think yes and no is the answer to that. I mean, you know, we're talking about the Kentucky Derby winner in May showing up in the Haskell, um, which which makes the field uh, e even more exciting. But then again, Brian, we're talking about uh, Bob Baffert trainee here and uh, an unbeaten Bob Baffert trainee, uh, an unbeaten Bob Baffert trainee that won its two races uh in style you know the guy has won the haskell nine times so i don't know i guess i was a little surprised but no do i think he's going to be the favorite arabian night yeah i think i do yeah there's a good chance there's a good chance he will be the favorite and i think the only reason is because of who his trainer is bob baffert nine haskell wins as you mentioned that's that's crazy you got to respect baffert but let's talk about Arabian Night. Let's jump right into the morning line favorite, Matt. He's, yeah, he's unbeaten, but he's only had two races. One was as a two-year-old, seven furlongs at Keeneland. He looked great. And then the other came in January in the slop, the grade three Southwest stakes. There wasn't a heck of a lot in there, Matt, as has been uh, shown through time. Again, it was in the slop. Again, it was in January, six months ago, uh, against this field. I think favoritism or near favoritism is too much too soon for a horse that's very unproven. Yeah, I I agree with you, Brian. But, you know, going back to when Arabian Night was purchased as a yearling for $2.3 million, um, there, you know, has been a lot of hype and a lot of buzz and I guess a lot to like about Arabian Night for a long time but then the reality of it is that he has those just those two starts yes they were impressive but uh you know uh, uh, they weren't against particularly strong fields he is now going to a grade one after like you said brian six months or so off and facing a pretty good field and pricing uh, facing a field of horses that are trained by some of the best other trainers in the country. Yeah, I think it's a very good field, Matt. I, I count six legitimate graded stakes three-year-olds in this field out of the eight, and uh, there are much more proven commodities than Arabian Night. Now, he could be any kind. I realize that. His first two races were very impressive. Six months off. The good news is he's working. His workouts are pretty darn impressive. Uh, you know, flight line only ran six races in his career and look what he did maybe arabian knight can get it done it wouldn't surprise me if arabian knight got it done but at the odds i think i'm going to look elsewhere matt uh first place we're going to look is number four mage mage is the co second choice i i, I figured he'd be below tapit trice in this spot but he's uh, listed as the co second choice he, he's not one of those country house uh, derby winners, Matt. He's, he's not one of those rich strike derby winners. He's run a lot of good races already. He's consistent. He's versatile. Uh, his last race, he was beaten in the Preakness, but there was absolutely zero pace that day for the Son of Good Magic. Mage looks like a legitimate contender for a three-year-old championship this year. Yeah, I think so. And then going back before the... The Derby victory, a Derby victory when he was pretty late raced. Uh, uh, he was in the Florida Derby against Forte and and ran a great race. Looked like he was maybe going to beat Forte in there, but uh, but was a close second. So, you know, he he's 
done very little wrong in his career and has looked good early on and showed a lot of promise early on and, and lived up to it in the Kentucky Derby. And the third in the Preakness was, uh, was, was, uh, uh, pretty good. Also considering the pace scenario, he's been off since then. Um, it seemed like, you know, he was a late commit to the Haskell. Um, I don't know. The connections are sounding a little, uh, wishy-washy about the whole thing saying they're getting ready for the Travers and just kind of putting a vibe out there that this horse might not be at a hundred percent for the Haskell, but I don't know if I buy all that. Yeah, that's BS in my book. Yes. <laughs> BS baby. Cause this, this is a million dollar grade one race. This is one of the best three-year-old races in the country. And it's got a feel that, supports that uh, that claim that the Haskell is one of the best thrill races in the country. This is a better field than the Preakness. It's a better field than maybe the Belmont. This is a good field, and Mage better be near 100%. If they are using – the word they used was a prep for the Travers. I, I did not enjoy seeing that. The Haskell should not be a prep for anything. If it's a prep and if he's 80% for this, hoping to be closer to 100% for the Travers, uh, you know, Mage is a horse that is very beatable in this spot. And, and maybe shame on the connections for not having him ready and for this and the, the Travers rather than just trying to get him ready for the Travers. We'll see. We'll see. Third choice or, or, or co-second choice, my third choice, is Tapit Trice, Matt. Tapit Trice is interesting to me because – all of those wins he had, I guess he had four wins in a row, were at nine furlongs or less. We think of Tappet Trice as kind of a long-winded son of Tappet who lopes along late, but all of his wins were at a mile and eighth or less, including the grade one bluegrass, the grade three Tampa Bay Derby. Um, yeah, the Derby didn't work out for him well. I'm going to make some excuses here. He was, you know, he was boxed in a little bit in traffic. Then he had to swing way wide, and then he wasn't persevered late. Derby wasn't good, disappointing, seventh. I thought his Belmont was very good. He was, uh, you know, beating a little over a length, right there with Forte at the finish. Todd Pletcher surprised how well he bounced out of the Belmont. He's been working well. There's some speed in this race. Why not tap it trice? Yeah, I agree, Brian. Why not tap it trice? Uh, uh, again, uh, things didn't go well for him in the Kentucky Derby, but – Aside from that, he's got a lot of nice races. That four in the row, four in a row. I think he ran well uh, in the in the Belmont Stakes. Also, he's got a speed figure uh, from the Belmont Stakes that is the second best speed figure in this Haskell field, and is a lot better than most of the others in the field, including Arabian Night. Yeah, yeah, Tapage Race is uh, interesting to me. You know, he's not a horse I generally pick out in the Haskell. Nine furlongs on track that can tend to favor speed a little bit, but it can also be a fair racetrack. I, I think Tapage Trice is in for a uh, a good performance here. Let's take a look at that speed and why I think maybe Tapage Trice has a little bit better shot in a race like this than I might normally think in other years. You see the fast pace. If you're watching, you can see Time Form US Pace Projector has that big red button on the top upper right map that says fast pace and included that are our three very talented horses. Uh, Go Rocket Ride on the rail, uh, Extra Anejo, the seven for Steve Asmussen and Arabian Night, of course, the horse we've already talked about. Not far behind, a long shot, awesome strong. So uh, there is a good chance that we'll have a good strong pace in here, which might make it harder for those well-liked up and coming horses Go Rocket Ride, Extra Anejo, and Arabian Night, and make it a little bit easier for horses who want to rally, including the Kentucky Derby winner and the Bluegrass winner. Yeah, and I, and I don't know if I agree with the pace projector in that it's got it's showing Tapa Trice being, you know, uh, uh, clearly in the back of the pack. I think Tapa Trice has run some more stalking races, and I think generally that running style is a better running style to have at Monmouth Park. Same thing can be said for Mage. You know, I uh, I would want to see Mage in this race uh, with one of his performances that is a little closer 
to this speed than farther behind. And, and Mage has thrown in a couple of those different kinds of uh, runs in his career. I, I will would be more concerned if this is one of the races where Mage gets off slowly and is at the back of the pack. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm going to agree with you to a point, but I'm also going to disagree with you to a point because I look at this pace projector, I see a very fast pace, a contentious pace with talented horses, and I see a pretty tight bunch there. They're not, uh, these chiclets aren't as spread out as some. So it doesn't look like the four, the three, salute the stars, and even the five, top and trace, are terribly far back in this pace projector. And if it's a fast pace and Tapich Rice is last and, and six, seven lengths off the uh, off the lead. That might not be a bad thing if it's a fast pace on Saturday at Monmouth Park. Let's talk about some of the other horses we've talked about because I, I, I think Arabian Night could be any kind, but I could very easily say the same about the one and the seven. Go Rocket Ride and Extra Anejo. Go Rocket Ride for Richard Mandela drew the rail. He's done nothing wrong in three career starts. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and a couple of things stand out for me with uh, Go Rocket Ride, and you mentioned Richard Mandela, uh, is that Mandela does not send horses all the way to the East Coast for a race like the Haskell very often. And and, and that is, is really interesting to me. Uh, in the past, Richard Mandela has sent one horse, just one horse, East Brian to run in the Haskell, and that was in the year 2000. And he had a winner back then with uh, Dixie Union. Uh, my feeling is that if Mandela's sending this horse, and again, another one of these lightly raced horses that could be, you know, could be very good uh, down the road to the Haskell, I think he means business. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to disagree with that. Mandela is one of the best in the business. Dixie Union 23 years ago for Mandela came and won, ran a big race. This this is a strong field, though. He's on the rail. There's other speed and there's other talent. So it, it's not an easy spot. I, I believe Mandela knows he has a good horse. But on the other hand, I, I don't know it's an easy spot for Go Rocket Ride, who has never before raced away from Santa Anita in his uh, two wins and a second. Uh, that second came to Practical Move. Yeah. He wasn't all that close to beating Practical Move uh, earlier this year, but uh, Go Rocket Ride only had a six furlong sprint before that. So uh, it was a good performance, and he's come back recently with a win in the Affirm. Another horse that I kind of lumped into that same category with Arabian Night and Go Rocket Ride is Extra Anejo. He's the one who hasn't been uh, in a stakes race or a graded stakes race yet, but Extra Anejo is talented. Uh, this is we we knew it last year at Keeneland when he won for fun in his debut. Uh, he he faced he chased a very fast sprinter when he got beat in, in his return race earlier this uh, spring, uh, but then he went to Ellis Park and that mile allowance race was huge. So just like Go Rocket Ride, uh, I, I think we can't sleep on these two as being possibly as talented or maybe even more talented than Arabian Night. Extra Anejo interests me as a horse who is of grade one quality, Matt. Yeah, he, he could be any kind. And he's another one that back to the back to the time when uh, when he was a yearling, he was a one point three million dollar yearling purchase. So he was a physical specimen way back then and uh and trainer steve asmussen who is also a past winner of the haskell his of course was with the philly rachel alexandra back in 2009 uh in that in that great performance um you know asmussen will take his time with a horse when he needs to and clearly has done that with extra anejo and and Asmussen, you know, has said this is a talented horse. It's a tough spot, though, to make your stakes appearance uh, debut. Yeah, and that's what I said about Go Rocket Ride, and I think we could say the same about Arabian Night. All three are really, really interesting horses who could be any kind. Arabian Night gets the undefeated and Bob Baffert nod, but the other two look really, really good to me as well. Problem is they're all speed as they step up to by far their toughest test yet. So 
Interesting. Uh, one other horse I, I for sure want to mention here, Matt, is the three, because I think he might be the forgotten horse in the bunch. Salute the stars for trainer Brad Cox. Uh, showed promise last year as a two-year-old on the turf, ran two very good turf races, maiden races, to begin his career. We didn't see him for a long time, but I really like the way he's won his last two races. Not by daylight, but he's shown a lot of heart. He's shown some tactical speed, but he's shown the ability to finish. Uh, he won a nice allowance at Churchill Downs, two starts back in his return race, and then to run down Kings Barnes after not the most ideal trip in, in that prep, in that Pegasus, uh, I thought was impressive. He needs to move forward, but Salute the Stars interests me. Yep, he needs to move forward. He looks like a horse that could move forward. He is a three-year-old in the barn of Brad Cox, and, and Cox is, you know, uh, has done really well this year with all those different, uh, different three-year-olds. As you said, he's got a victory over the track in the Monmouth Park Pegasus, and he beat a really nice horse in King's Barnes, who's from the barn of Thad Pletcher. Yeah, yeah. Salute the stars. He got that race over the track. He's battle tested. His current form is there. He's for Brad Cox, and he can finish. Uh, sixth choice in the Haskell. That, that's an interesting sixth choice to me. All right, Matt. That's that's our Haskell preview. We're going to come back with our picks later, and and we could have chose seven several races, including of course the United Nations on turf. But I think we decided that. Uh, Hey, we want to go with the horses that people know a little bit more and followed. Obviously, the Haskell was the, the key race and those Kentucky Derby horses. But then we have Kentucky Oaks horses showing up at a great one at Saratoga on Saturday. Saratoga will have another big weekend of fillies and mares. But it starts on Saturday with the grade one coaching club, American Oaks. Let me pull that up. It's not the biggest field in the world. But um, let, let me ask you this, Matt. Is there pretty mischievous? Is the leader of the division? She's going to run short in the test, it looks like. Uh, is there a horse in this race that could potentially soon take the three year old mantle away from pretty mischievous? Well, if, if that is going to be the case, then uh, winning the coaching club American Oaks at a mile and eighth uh, would be a great. Uh, place to start to try and do that. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a big race. It leads to the Alabama. It leads to races against older females. Older females look strong right now, but uh, certainly at least four of these six are in the conversation. Very interesting fillies and could all jump up and uh, I think challenge for this division. Uh, let's just start on the rail out this time, Matt. South Lawn it ran a head scratcher. She was my poor pick to win the Kentucky Oaks uh, less than, I guess, about two and a half months ago. South Lawn had looked so good in two straight races at fairgrounds for trainer Norm Cassie, but she threw in a stinker in the Kentucky Oaks. Yeah, that's for sure, Brian. And I guess, Brian, since, the, since it's turned out that we haven't seen South Lawn since that 10th place finish in the Kentucky Oaks. I guess we can say that something went wrong. Some little thing went wrong. Not, not, you know, not too badly, but enough to explain the 10th place performance. Um, she's gotten some time since the, uh, the Kentucky Oaks, a couple months off and uh, now comes back for Norm Cassie in this grade one uh, again not an easy race to come back to even off of just a two-month layoff yeah she she's the real uh wild card in here for me Matt. and, and there's a few reasons why Florent Giroux gets on uh this time South Lawn but uh if you look at those fairground races you could easily say that South Lawn was on her way to be being the best three-year-old filly in the country she won an overpowering allowance race by eight lengths, and then she beat, as we know now, uh, some of the best fillies in the country. She'd be pretty mischievous early for the win, easy for the win, and uh, Hoosier Philly was one of those left in her wake down the stretch. Um, I thought she had horse on the turn in the Kentucky Oaks, but then she came up completely empty. She's had some issues, physical issues before, so... I'm not sure what to think. She could pop up here and she could be 
all that I thought she might be before the Kentucky Oaks. Number two is probably the horse to beat. Um, it's a question who's going to be the favorite, but this Godolphin homebred certainly is a good choice to be the favorite. She's run a lot of good races. She's won three stakes this year. She's been beaten in her last two, but I can't really fault her too much for those defeats at uh, Churchill Downs and Ellis Park. Yeah, and and as big a season as Godolphin had last year, it's not going quite as uh, as it did last year, and wet paint uh, being an example of that. Yeah, wet paint, you know, had had three stakes wins in a row at Oakwan Park, but uh, since leaving then has not been able to get back to the winner's circle. A fourth place in the Kentucky Oaks, I guess, was a little uh, disappointing, considering the way uh, – the way that she had been going, and then most recently a second in the Monomoy Girl uh, behind Hoosier Philly, and I guess we'll talk more about her in a bit. Yeah, the Kentucky Oaks was not quite what they were hoping for from the from the favorite. On the other hand, she ran a pretty good race. She was down inside in the big field, and she uh, she wasn't beaten all that much in the Kentucky Oaks, but she wasn't the best Philly and the Kentucky Oaks that's running in this race. Um, last time in the Monomoy Girl, I, I, I like her performance. There was no pace. Who's your Philly just cruised on the lead and, and, and was going to win that race easy. But wet pace really rallied at, at the flat mile last time. Uh, she doesn't have much speed. And uh, that will be a refrain for me here in, in a minute. Number three is Sacred Wish. George Weaver, our old friend George Weaver, trains this one she's been a little in and out but she's shown flashes of being good yes she has brian uh, uh out being her ninth place performance in the black eyed susan um on preakness weekend at pimlico um her in uh, was a uh second place performance in the Gulfstream park oaks which is a grade two um, earlier in the year and most recently has got a second in an allowance at Belmont Park. Um, I don't know, Brian. Even even her the best race that second in Gulfstream Park uh, Oaks uh, may not be enough as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and you're probably right, Matt. She's probably uh, the fifth or sixth filly in here as far as chances to win the coaching club on the American Oaks. But on the other hand, I've seen George Weaver bring up a lot of horses to Saratoga in the summer. And, and do really well. And Sacred Wish, if you draw a line through that black-eyed Susan, I don't mind what I see there. Uh, she's getting better, the daughter of not this time. The last race at Belmont, muddy track, a good speed figure. Take a look at her if she's uh, big odds on Saturday. Number four was the horse that we decided on the as the favorite. Maybe um, Todd Putcher, Irad Ortiz Jr. had something to do with it. A gambling girl ran a big race in the Kentucky Oaks her last race. Yeah. New York bred uh, Brian, who uh, um, kind of was a bit of a surprise in the Kentucky Oaks. And am I remembering that ga that you liked Gambling Girl a bit getting into the into the Oaks? If uh, if my old memory serves me uh, serves you're, me well, you're you're right, Matt. Um, South Lawn was my top pick, though, so I can't take too much credit. My my long shot was Gambling Girl, and she came running. Yeah, she cer she certainly did. Um, before that, she was second in the Gazelle uh, against Open Company uh, at Aqueduct, and had a fourth in the Honey Bee at uh, Oaklawn Park. Um, but yeah, the uh, that second in the Kentucky Oaks was a surprise. But if she can run back to that, you got to think about her. I don't know about thinking about her as the favorite, but. Uh, She's a threat if she can run like that again. Yeah, yeah. Off that Kentucky Oaks, she's going to get a lot of play with Todd Pletcher and Irad Ortiz Jr. Um, and, and she's been a pretty consistent filly, and I think she is slowly but surely moving forward, too. A stakes winner against only New York Red so far, but she is knocking on the door in big races, and uh, she certainly deserves a big look here. Um, just like wet paint, though, she really doesn't have much early speed, and I think that um uh makes me wonder just a little bit in this spot a pretty short field can be tough to come from too far out of it we'll see probably her and wet paint won't be as far back as they have been in some races 
Uh, but it'll be interesting to see how Gambling Girl returns after the, after the time away. Number five is Who's Your Philly? And as we look at the four favorites in here, including Wet Paint, Gambling Girl, South Lawn, and Who's Your Philly? Who's Your Philly is the control and speed. She's the one with the uh, the quick start. Uh, a really good two-year-old match. She took her lumps earlier this year, including uh, uh, getting bombed by South Lawn down in Fairgrounds. But she is getting better by the start for trainer Tom Amos. Yes, absolutely, Brian. We remember she won those three races in a row last year as a two-year-old, and and Tom Amos was, you know, talking a uh, uh, big things about who's your filly, and maybe maybe she's back um, uh, after that win in the Monomoy Girl. And you mentioned it in in our rundown uh, earlier that uh, you know she had the race her way, getting out there on the lead, and and and, and controlling the race out front but you know brian what why isn't she going to be able to do that again in this field yeah that, that that's a big question and and that might be a reason to like her again as she's improving here <clears throat> this summer excuse me uh we're looking at now at the time form us pace projector and they do have another horse close early uh doesn't look like a fast pace at all in this six for uh six horse field but um uh, there is one horse that could pressure her, and she's the horse we haven't talked about yet. She's looking lucky. Um, if it's easy, uh, she is a big threat to win this as potentially the third choice in here, although I think the top three will be close in, in the betting. Um, who's your filly? She had it easy at Ellis Park. It was an easy lead. I don't think it'll be quite as easy here. Uh, wet paint rallied well, as I said, but who's your filly was just cruising down the lane. So I think I think it was a very good performance, even though she had things her own way. And if she gets her things, as you said, her own way here, look out. The last horse on the list is she's looking lucky. She's the horse that was close to lose your filly on the pace projection. I, I think she's the filly on like sixth best out of the six. But uh, she could have a say in how this race is run because she does have some speed. If she wants to take the race a little bit to Hoosier Philly, that makes life tougher for Hoosier Philly. Yeah, and and maybe the fact that, you know, in her last race, um, an allowance at Ellis Park, she won by seventh lengths, uh, making it look very easy on a sloppy and sealed track. And maybe it was that victory that has been a factor in that pace projector that we saw putting her relatively close to uh Hoosier Philly uh so I, I'm not quite sure she's going has the quality to be able to actually be that close to Hoosier Philly yeah I, on the other hand again I'll play devil's advocate to you Matt and sorry to do this a couple times this show uh for me it's not about is she a threat to win the race? I really don't like the six in this spot. And I, I think that was, you know, it, it looks good on paper, but I'm not buying what she did at Ellis Park last time. But all it takes is for her to go out in the first four, four, four furlongs and soften who's your filly up. And that could change who wins the coaching club American Oaks in my eyes. All right. We've talked about two big grade one races, Kentucky Derby horses, Kentucky Oaks horses, Alabama horses, Travers horses, but they're big in their own right. Certainly the Haskell. Don't tell me the Haskell's a prep race, Matt Shipman. No, absolutely not, Brian. It's one of the big ones. It is one of the big ones. New Jersey's biggest. It's time for top picks. We're going to start with the Haskell, Matt, and we're going to start with you. Okay, Brian. You know, I... Uh, uh, I just have to talk a little bit more about Arabian Night. You know, uh, I know it's there's that six month layoff, but I, I think Baffert's going to have this horse cranked up. Uh, he's showing a series of long workouts, six furlongs, seven furlongs, and they have been fast. And that's what Baffert does when he wants to bring a horse back and have them at the top of their form. All said, I am not picking Arabian Night. I, I want to take advantage of the fact that he is going to be heavily bet because of all the things we've said said during the show. I think he will be the favorite. He may even be less than the nine than the five to two in the morning line. And, and I can't go with him in, in, in terms of uh, things that we have said 
earlier on. So I'm going to take advantage and look for a horse that's going to have better odds. I am going to go with Richard Mandela and go Rocket Ride. I hope that um, he will run more of a stalking trip. He's shown, I think, a tendency to be able to do that in this field and sit two, three lengths behind what could be a hot pace and take over the race down the stretch. Yeah, it, it, an interesting race. I think there are six horses here. So I'm, clearly I'm looking for some odds. Arabian Night, yeah, his workouts are fantastic. And he, he could win this, but I don't want him with six really good horses off a six-month layoff, off of being unproven against class horses. So I'm looking for someone to beat him. And I, and I did to think about some others in here. But Salute the Stars, I just like the way he's in form now. He's proven tough. He's got to win over the track. I think he can rally. That, that that might be the biggest difference in our handicapping of this race, Matt, because I'm looking for horses to come from off the pace a little bit because I, I think it will be a contentious pace on Saturday. So salute the stars for me, for trainer Brad Cox, and 8-1 to one on the morning line. CCA Oaks, the coaching club American Oaks, it looks like we're on the same page, Matt. Yeah, it looks like we're both going with Hoosier Philly. Um I think that Tom Amos has got Hoosier Philly back on track. You know, he had she had that win in the Monomoy Girl, but before that, she was second in the Black Eyed Susan. Uh, so um, I think Hoosier Philly is back on track, and I think that Hoosier Philly can get out on the lead and can and can control that race. And if we can get her as not the favorite, you said something about third choice that makes it even more attractive. Yeah, we both picked her, if I remember correctly, in the Monomoy Girl. She was not the favorite there, although she wasn't exactly a long shot either. But we're both on her again in the CCA Oak. She's never won a race this big, and, and I need to see it. But on the other hand, there's four obvious contenders here, top contenders in here, and she's the only one with any speed of the four. I, too, think she's getting better, like the controlling speed. I'm on Hoosier Philly as well. All right, Matt. Exciting weekend ahead. I can't wait to see some of those races. Let me get a parting shot from you before we say goodbye. Absolutely, Brian. Great doing the show with you again this week. I will be at Monmouth Park on Saturday for the Haskell. So I look forward to seeing some of you Horse Center folks there. If you see me wandering around, say, hey, Matt, why are you wandering around? Say hello and put me back on my task. There you go. All right. That, that, that sounds like fun. I wish I was at Monmouth just to say hello. <laughs> to Matt Schiffman. I want to thank everybody for watching every week. Uh, we sure do appreciate it. We'll be back next week uh, with a show led by the Jim Dandy, the other big three-year-old race of the early summer. Uh, I also want to thank Candace Curtis for the great race graphics, our friend at the home office, Derby Wars, the best contest site out there. And of course, Time Form US for those great pace projections. Uh, but most importantly, thank you for watching. We'll be back next week. We can't wait to see you then. Till then. Good luck.